As I said, we're excited to have Dick Bennett here with us. I've known uh, him since 1975 when I first came to work in, in the library and he was working uh, uh, on the uh, centennial history of the library at the time, right? Working with President Wilkinson. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah, centennial history of BYU, not the library. And uh, so we've been uh, colleagues for all this time except he did move away from BYU for a time and became head of special collections at the University of Manitoba for uh, uh, almost 20 years he was there. And so uh, you might uh, understand how good a friend he is to our special collections and to the library in general. We appreciate him uh, coming. He is a professor of church history and doctrine and uh, he teaches history, uh, classes in church history and classes in, uh, on the doctrine and covenants. And he has prepared a lecture for us based on a chapter that he uh, wrote in the book Civil War Saints. Uh, and his uh, title of his lecture today, My Heart is Filled with Pain, The American Civil War and Changing Mormon Attitudes. Would you please uh, join me in welcoming Richard Bennett. Thank you, Scott. And thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me? I think I could have chosen a better title. This one sounds a little bit painful. For a cheerful person such as myself, I should have done a little better than this, but uh, this is a quote from Brigham Young. I hope you can bear with me as we go through some pain on this, uh, the study of Mormon changing attitudes during the Civil War. I do want to commend the, the library for their wonderful display on the Civil War, for the wonderful work that the library is doing for our faculty on cross campus, and special collections for the way they've treated us as faculty. We, we, I just want you to know how much we deeply appreciate this. And thank you for the opportunity to, to come today. While peace reigns in Utah, Civil war, with all its horrors, prevails among those who earnestly desire to see the soil of these valleys crimsoned with the blood of the saints. And if we are mistaken in the signs of the times, before the conflict between the North and the South shall have ended, all they unitedly desire to see meted out to the Mormons will be poured out without measure upon those who have initiated this war of extermination and are now carrying it on with all the energy they severally possess. So read the lead editorial in the Salt Lake Deseret News shortly after Confederate gunboats and shore batteries had blasted Fort Sumter into submission and surrender at the April 1861 outbreak of the Great War between the North and the South. The history of that American conflict continues to attract discussion and debate. Books and articles continue to be written. Battles and skirmishes are every year reenacted. And new views and interpretations abound in a field of study that remains riveted deeply in our history. Yet Mormon scholars have generally tended to leave it alone and far away, as if it were the other guy's war. That conflict between, or excuse me, beyond the mountains to the east that America had brought upon itself. The purpose of this short study today is to try to redress that imbalance somewhat, not by re-examining what minor role Utah and the Mormons played militarily in the conflict in the territories, 
but by proffering a preliminary analysis of public statements made by the leading authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. During the Civil War years of 1861 to 1865, comments that may reveal their interpretations of the conflict and the causes of the nation's discomfiture. It is never easy to capture faithfully the tenor of a past time, the mood in the air, and in this case, the more rarefied air of a Rocky Mountain Zion. The time see, seems so black and white, north and south, a Mormon political kingdom and a nation apart. America, when it took the time, regarded Utah as an evil miscreant, a religion out of time and out of tune, harboring that other relic of barbarism. On the other hand, from most Mormon pulpits and papers, spilled forth a tirade of wrathful indignation against those who had so badly treated them in the past. Somewhere in between, perhaps this side of moderation, lay the truth. Whatever the case, the purpose of this paper today is to try to answer the following four questions. Number one, how did prominent Mormon leaders interpret the underlying cause of the American Civil War? Number two, did their feelings and attitudes change as the conflict deepened and degenerated into the worst spectacle of human suffering the country had ever experienced? Three, were there recognizable differences in opinion and viewpoints among the most prominent LDS leaders? And four, what effect, if any, did the war have on their view of someday possibly returning to their Missouri Zion? The cup of Mormon indignation was brimful long before 1861. Ever since the government sanctioned expulsion from their homes in Missouri in the 1830s, followed by the awful persecutions of Illinois, the martyrdom of prophet leaders, and later President James Buchanan's dispatching of a United States Army to Utah to put down and destroy an alleged religious dictatorship, Mormonism had been hurt, hated, and hunted by an America bent on its reformation, if not destruction. There's ample evidence to show in Mormon scripture that they, or we, however you want to say it, themselves were responsible for much of their greatest troubles. From one Ohio revelation, you know well, 1832, quote, for shall the children of the kingdom pollute my holy land? Verily I say unto you, nay. And from section 101 in Clay County, Missouri in 1833, Verily I say unto you, the Latter-day Saints, concerning your brethren who have been afflicted and persecuted and cast out from the land of their inheritance, I, the Lord, have suffered the affliction to come upon them, wherein they have been afflicted in consequence of their transgressions. Yet as the years passed, different interpretations came to predominate. In one of Joseph Smith's earlier revelations, he had prophesied in 1829 of a desolating scourge that shall go forth among the inhabitants of the earth and shall continue to be poured out from time to time if they repent not until the earth is empty and the inhabitants thereof are consumed away and utterly destroyed by the brightness of my coming. By the time the Latter-day Saints were driven from Illinois 17 years later, diary and sermon were replete with condemnations, warnings, and expectations of an imminent premillennial judgment and wrath. To deny such, is to deny their sense of history, justice, and prophecy. Said Brigham Young, just prior to leaving winter quarters for the West in 1847, the whisperings of the Spirit to us have invariably been of the same import, 
to depart, to go hence, to flee into the mountains, to retire to our strongholds, that we may be secure in the visitation of the judgments that must pass upon this land that is crimson with the blood of martyrs, and that we may be hid, as it were, in the clefts of the rocks and in the hollows of the land of the great Jehovah, while the guilty land of our fathers is purified by an overwhelming scourge. There simply had to be a price to pay, an inevitable meeting out of justice, a balancing of the equation for the several injustices inflicted upon the Latter-day Saints. To the first point then, that of prophecy, the evidence is overwhelming that to the Latter-day Saints, the Civil War was a fulfillment of prophecy. Said Brigham Young just weeks before the outbreak of war, I have heard Joseph Smith say, you will see the sorrows and misery that will be upon this land until you will turn away and pray that your eyes may not be obliged to look upon it. There are men in this council, he's referring to the 12, that will live to see the affliction that will come upon this nation until their hearts sink within them. Orson Hyde, on a later occasion, referred to the same prophecy when he said, Joseph Smith once said, on the stand in Nauvoo, that if the government of the United States did not redress the wrongs of the Mormon people afflicted upon them in the state of Missouri, the whole nation should be distracted by mobs from one end to the other, and that they should have mobs to the full and to their heart's content. I heard the foregoing statement myself as it fell from the lips of the prophet in the presence of thousands of witnesses. Besides his 1829 revelation already cited, Joseph Smith was best remembered for his 1832 prophecy about the war that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. Given 12 years before his own death and 29 years before the war itself broke out, Joseph Smith's revelation gave several more details, ending with a statement of cause not overlooked by his followers and successors, that the cry of the saints and of the blood of the saints shall cease to come up to be avenged of their enemies. Wilfred Woodruff, speaking in 1862, was but one of many who repeated the prophecy arguing it is hard, excuse me, it is a hard dealing of the Almighty and we cannot help it. Every elder in this church who lives his religion knows that this which is now transpiring is according to the mind and foreshadowings of the Holy Spirit. It is out of the power of man, excepting by the repentance of the whole nation, for they have shed the blood of the prophets driven this church and people from their midst and have turned those keys that will seal their condemnation. And said Brigham Young on an earlier occasion, I heard Joseph Smith say nearly 30 years ago, and he's saying this in 1862, they shall have mobbing to their heart's content if they do not redress the wrongs of the Latter-day Saints. Mobs will not decrease but will increase until the whole government becomes a mob. And eventually it will be state against state, city against city, neighborhood against neighborhood, Methodist against Methodist, and so on. Brigham Young returned again to this theme of prophecy fulfilled near the war's end when he said in 1864, Joseph said many and many a time to us, Never be anxious for the Lord to pour out his judgments upon the nation. Many of you will see the distress and evils poured out upon this nation till you will weep like children. One last reference to the prophetic element. John Taylor, just one week before the end of the war, argued against those who believed the saints had lost faith in America because of such prophecies. 
But did not Joseph Smith prophesy that there would be rebellion in the United States? He countered. He did. And so have I, scores and hundreds of times. And what of that? Could I help that? Could Joseph Smith help knowing that a rebellion would take place in the United States? Could he help knowing it would commence in South Carolina? You could not blame him for that. He was in his grave at that time it commenced. If the Lord, we all talk about the Lord, you know, Christians as well as Mormons, and about the providence of God and the interposition of the Almighty, if the Lord has a design to accomplish, if there is a fate, if you like the word any better, and some infidels as well as Christians believe strongly in the doctrine of fate, if there is a fate in these things, who ordered it? Who can change its course? Who can stop it? Who can alter it? No less earnest to the Latter-day Saints than this matter of fulfilling prophecy was the urgent expectation, at least among some leaders, of retributive justice. God has come out of his hiding place, said Brigham Young, and has commenced to vex the nation and has rejected us. And he will vex, vex it with a sore vexation. It will not be patched up. It never can come together again but it will be sifted with a sieve of vanity, and in a short time it will be like water spilled on the ground. I have never prayed for the destruction of the government, said Heber C. Kimball in 18, April 1861, but I know that dissolution, sorrow, weeping, and distress are in store for the inhabitants of the United States because of their conduct towards the people of God. Now, more of a hardliner than perhaps most of his colleagues, Heber C. Kimball often expressed very strong feelings. Speaking just a few months later, he reminded his listeners, several of whom were recent convert immigrants from England, of their paths of persecution. Many of you are strangers to these things, both members and elders, because you were not baptized into the church until afterwards, he said. But still, you can see what the world has done to us. And everything in the shape of persecution or affliction which the world have brought upon us will come back upon their heads tenfold. And this nation in particular will reap what they have sown. And their troubles have already commenced. But I shall live to see them broken to pieces a great deal worse than they are now. The blood of retributive justice is on them and the destruction of this nation is sealed, except they will repent, which is not very probable. In May of 1862, Kimball returned to the same theme. The South and the North are at war with each other, are slaying each other. And if they were not doing that, they would be trying to slay us. This they do already in their hearts. And the sin is the same upon the nation as though they did it in reality. I am a martyr of God, and so is Brother Brigham, and other men of God whose lives they have hunted. God will chastise them, and all those who had a hand in seeking our destruction. Let the saints acknowledge the hand of God in it all. Orson Hyde echoed Kimball's sentiments at least early on in the war when he said of the atrocities committed earlier against the saints, what can we expect other than that a righteous God, a faithful sovereign would make just such a requisition upon the nation as he is now making? Justice, though sometimes slow in its operations, is nevertheless sure to obtain its demands. Their specifics are not hard to find. The expulsion of the Mormons from Missouri, the extermination order of Governor Boggs, the Hans Mill Massacre, Martin Van Buren's weakness and unwillingness to intervene federally, especially in light of James Buchanan's recent decision to send an army of intervention to Utah. These were deep and long festering wounds the saints would not be allowed to forget. If, said Brigham Young, Van Buren had said, be still or I will chasten you and keep sacred the oath of my office, we should not have been mobbed and the nation would not have been as it is today. And as to Johnston's army, the following response of several portrays the overriding sentiment. By the way, you all know about the Utah War 
the United States Army, 5,000 soldiers come out to put down the so-called Mormon Rebellion. Who frustrated that army in their design? Asked Wilford Woodruff. The Lord our God, and now the judgments that have come upon the nation in consequence of their treatment to this people are a sore vexation to them. But it's the hard dealing of the Almighty and we cannot help it. Though these and other grievances re received their space, it was Carthage Jail and June of 1844 that most galvanized Mormon attitudes. As per the lyrics, wake up the world for the conflict of justice and W. W. Phelps enduring him of praise. It was the martyrdom of Joseph and his brother Hiram that forever re remained. Writer after writer, speaker after speaker returned to Carthage choosing to see it as the watershed of God's wrath. They spurned from their presence the man who would acknowledge that God should reign king of nations. He was like a god to us and is to the nations of the earth and will continue to be. He was the prophet of the Lord. Were they aware of it at the seat of government? I have no doubt. They as well knew the plans for destroying the prophet as did those in Carthage or in Warsaw, Illinois. It was planned by some of the leading men of the nation. In killing him, they killed their best earthly friend, wrote another, the man who of all others was best able to save them from themselves, from that anarchy, misery, and destruction they would bring upon themselves. Perhaps this 1864 Millennial Star editorial likely penned by George Q. Cannon, while yet president of the British mission, expressed the sentiment best. War, dreadful, and continued war. War and its concomitants, famine and pestilence, will purge and purify the earth of the ungodly. Already our boasted land of liberty, the asylum for the oppressed in the new world is deluged with blood and will continue to be so until it has atoned for rejecting the gospel and refusing to avenge the wrongs of our people and for passively sanctioning the murder of God's servants. The rock bed sentiment is not always synonymous with the public rhetoric. To the contemporary ear, such Mormon statements may be as hard to accommodate as are the columns and cartoons of hate and prejudice in the Eastern press against the Latter-day Saints. There can be no mistaking, however, the division the bifurcation, the harsh feelings. Yet the Latter-day Saints were expecting, expressing convictions, not seeking vengeance. Their belief that America would suffer was motivated less out of a desire to see hurt and more out of their conviction in the restoration and in the mission of the Prophet Joseph. For do you suppose that you can get rid of the justice of an offended God who hath been trampled under feet of men? As surely as ancient empires were destroyed for neglecting prophets of old, so history must repeat itself. Or as George A. Smith put it in 1861, by and by it will be like it was with the Jaredites and the Nephites. Now, a few other comments, particularly those made at the outset of the war, deserve attention. If some in the East were expecting a short conflict with a quick and glorious Union victory, no such interpretation came out of Utah. Even before the first shot was fired, the Mormon expectation was that the war would be a long and horrible conflict. Do any of you think this war is going to be over in a few days, asked Heber C. Kimball in 18, May of 1861. If you do, you are greatly mistaken. Will it be over in six months or three years, followed Brigham Young just a few months later? No, this will take years and will never cease until the work is accomplished. There may be seasons that the fire will appear to be extinguished, and the first you know it will break out in another portion, and all is on fire again, and it will spread and continue until the land is emptied. As late as September 1864, some were predicting an almost never-ending conflict, or at least a season of many wars. A very large proportion of the people imagined that the nation is on the eve of peace, and an entire settlement of the difficulties, said George Q. Cannon. But you and I, and all believers in God's revelations, know how cruelly they deceive themselves 
or rather suffer the great enemy of their souls to deceive them upon this point. Running parallel to these dire predictions of an extended conflict were the repeated expressions of gratitude and appreciation that the Latter-day Saints were now far removed from the arena of war. If we were in Missouri, we should be obliged to take sides in the present lamentable strife of brother against brother, said George A. Smith in 61. If we were there, we should be in constant trouble. Later, on the 4th of July, 1861, he said, Now, brethren, are we not thankful that at least we can see the providence of the Almighty in suffering us to be driven into these valleys where we can enjoy the sweets of true liberty, where none dare molest or make afraid? And Brigham Young followed suit. Do we appreciate the blessings of this our mountain home, far removed from the war, blood, carnage, and death that are laying low in the dust, thousands of our fellow creatures, in the very streets we have walked, and in the cities and towns where we have lived. Indeed, the Latter-day Saints as a people were not drawn into taking sides in the war. And while it's true that Utah remained loyal to the Union and even equipped small regiments to defend government property during the war when called upon, the Mormon view was essentially one of neutrality. John Taylor's famous comments, 4th of July, 1861, early in the war, bear repeating in this regard. It may now be proper to inquire, what part shall we take in the present difficulties? In regard to the present strife, it's a warfare among brothers. We have neither inaugurated nor assisted in its inauguration. We have been hunted like the deer on the mountains. Our men have been whipped, banished, imprisoned, and put to death. We have been driven from city to city, from state to state, for no just cause of compl or complaint. Shall we join the North to fight against the South? No. Shall we join the South against the North? As emphatically, no. Why? They have both brought it upon themselves, and we have no hand in the matter. We know no North, no South, no East, no West. But as the war intensified, was there a softening in Mormon attitude? As news of the slaughters at Shiloh, Antietam, Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, Vicksburg, Gettysburg reached Utah almost instantaneously over the newly completed transcontinental telegraph lines, did such tragedy give pause to ponder and perhaps to recast their view of the war in a different hue? Did they see other broader factors at work. Speaking at the Bowery in Salt Lake City, the Sunday morning of the 31st of August, 1862, President Young, after excoriating once, America once more for Carthage jail, lamented the great destruction of human life, and in a tone perhaps not yet heard before, said the following, My heart is filled with pain for the inhabitants of the earth, we desire with all our hearts to do them good. It is our duty to pray for them and place before them the holy principles of the gospel by precept and in the acts of our lives, rather than to hold prominently forward their manifold corruptions. They are in the hands of God, and so are we. The most meaningful expression of sympathy that could express would be to proclaim the gospel to America and to perform a lasting work of redemption for both their living and the dead. We expect to build hundreds and thousands of cities and magnificent temples and officiate for our forefathers and relatives and for those ignorant thousands who are killing each other in the present war. And we will give them a salvation. By the middle of 1863, Brigham Young was referring to the war less as a punishment and more as an unnecessary war, a useless war, in which more than a half a million of the brave sons of our country now sleep in the dust. I don't think I have a suitable name for them, he said later that year. Shall we call them abolitionists, slaveholders, bigots or political aspirants? Call them what you will. They are wasting 
away each other. Not anxious to take sides over the divisive issue of slavery or even Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, the Mormon leader said, will the present struggle free the slaves? No, but they are wasting away the black race by the thousands. Many of the blacks are treated worse than we treat our dumb brutes, and they will be called a judgment for the way they have treated them. On receiving news of the bloodletting at Gettysburg, even Heber C. Kimball sounded less assuredly than he once did. When the trouble will be at an end is not for me to say. Now the Presbyterians of the North are preaching and praying against their Presbyterian brethren in the South. And this is precisely the condition of the Baptists, Methodists, Quakers, and Shakers. And I'm real sorry that this is the case. There are many honorable and peaceable citizens who are moving west in consequence of the lamentable state of our once happy and peaceful country. And from the Millennial Star, we do not, however, allude to these events now in a spirit of bitterness or revenge. Our hearts grieve over the sufferings of our misguided but obstinate brethren and sisters on the other side of the water. How shall they be saved? And by 1864, the talk had turned to an invitation to repentance as the only solution to the stalemate of human suffering. Can the inhabitants of our once beautiful, delightful, and happy country avert the horrors and evils now up upon them, asked Brigham Young, only by turning from their wickedness and calling upon the Lord. If they will turn unto the Lord and seek after him, they will avert this terrible calamity. Now it is tempting to argue that there was a softening in Mormon attitudes towards America as the war progressed. It's such as hard to prove conclusively since for every note of conciliation, there were still cries of indignation. If there was one Latter-day Saint spokesman, however, who ever sounded a more conciliatory note, a more global view, and who gave a broader interpretation of America's present distress and the injustices of Carthage, it was the very man who was there when the prophet died. Whether due to his British background or more global interests, John Taylor, place the causes of the war, indeed of all wars, in the larger context of man's inhumanity to man and his recurring disobedience to God. Rarely did he place Mormon sufferings in the center of the cauldron, opting instead to see far greater forces of cause and effect at work. When we think of the trouble that is likely to overtake this nation as well as others, it is calculated to create a sympathetic feeling in the bosoms of all who reflect. For some weeks past, I have been reviewing the events current in the nation, and I have felt a great deal of commiseration, and especially laterally. If there is a cessation of hope and hostilities against us, it is not for want of a disposition, but owing to the peculiar situation in which they are placed relative, relative to each other. They are led captive by the devil and are in a great measure controlled by him. This is truly a lamentable position, but the picture is not overdrawn. Do we rejoice over them? No, we do not. We have frequently offered to them the principles of life, but who is this God of battles? Why the devil, the prince, and power of the air. And what shall we do in the midst of these things that are now transpiring? Why? Lean upon the Lord our God. Purify ourselves. Let us also look at our positions as elders in Israel, clothed with the power of the holy priesthood, as men who hold the ministry of reconciliation. This is the position we ought to occupy in relation to these matters. In a later address, John Taylor saw the war less as punishment and more the result of a depraved character of men. The world has been full of darkness and wickedness and has not understood the things of God. But many of the past, as well as the present generations, have been full of bloodthirstiness, fraud, and oppression without any correct principles, without the Spirit of the Lord to direct them. It is so now, and hence the war and turmoil that at present exist in these United States. Elder Taylor also repeated his conviction that the war was 
but part of a rising tide of worldwide calamities and atrocities brought on by mankind because of the rejection of the principles of the gospel of Christ. The Lord has begun to vex the nations, he said, midway through the Civil War, beginning with our own. He is vexing it and will vex other nations, and his judgments will go forth, and all the wicked nations of the world will feel the avenging hand of God. And he will continue to overthrow nation after nation until he whose right it is will take the government into his own hand. There remains one final topic to discuss, and if it is not central to Latter-day Saint views of the war, then certainly it's a fascinating corollary to it. And what impact did the war have in the view of many that Zion, Missouri, must be reclaimed by the returning Latter-day Saints? The topic is a complicated one, but the study would be incomplete if I did not attempt to show, at least in part, that there was lively Mormon interest in what was happening in western Missouri, especially Jackson County, during the conflict. Was the time ripening for a return to Zion? May there have been another purpose to the war? There is little question that Mormon attention fastened more on Jackson County during those years than any other arena of the Civil War. If great pitched battles were never fought there, then there should have been. And what skirmishes and troubles did take place there, the Deseret News was very quick to report. The following is but one of several news stories carried on the topic. The interest of the people of Utah in Jackson County, Missouri, prompts the publication of the following extracts. Devastation in Jackson County, Missouri. The depopulation of the counties in Jackson, Cass, Bates, and Vernon is thorough and complete. One may ride for hours without seeing a single inhabitant, and deserted houses and farms are everywhere. The whole is a grand picture of desolation. Heber C. Kimball saw the impending conflict as a possible means of fulfilling another prophecy. The United States will suffer, for they will be afflicted with wars and with trouble at home. And while this is going on, the man who lives his religion and honors his calling will be prospered and go back to Jackson County with the faithful elders where they will receive their inheritance. And likewise, Brigham Young, at least in the early goings, saw the possible return of his people and sounded the, calling, the call of warning and preparation. Just as soon as the Latter-day Saints are ready and prepared to return to Independence, Jackson County in the state of Missouri, he said, just as soon will the voice of the Lord be heard. Arise now, Israel, and make your way to the center stake of Zion. Do you believe that we as Latter-day Saints are preparing our own hearts, our own lives, to return to take possession of the center stake of Zion as fast as the Lord is preparing it? We must be pure to be prepared to build up Zion. And to all appearance, the Lord is preparing that end of the route faster than we are preparing ourselves to go. In 1862, Brigham Young returned to the same theme, referring to the frustratingly slow construction of the Salt Lake Temple. As you remember, it took 40 years to build it for a host of reasons, and said, I'm afraid we shall not get it up, the temple that is, until we have, until we have to go back to Jackson County, which I expect will be in seven years. I do not want to quite finish this temple, for there will not be any temple finished until the one in is finished in Jackson County, as pointed out by Joseph Smith. Keep this as a secret to yourselves, let some become discouraged. And come to the end of 1863 with the war at fever pitch, a watchful Wilford Woodruff had also come to the conclusion that this might be the long-awaited time. The Lord is watching over the interests of Zion and sustains his kingdom upon the earth and is preparing the way for the return of his saints to Jackson County, Missouri, to build up the waste places of Zion. Jackson County has been entirely cleared of its inhabitants during the year 1863, which is one of the greatest miracles manifested in our day. And those who have driven the saints out and spoiled them are in their turn now driven out and spoiled. Of course, the saints never did return to Missouri, and the topic remains for much, much further study. At long last, America's deadliest war ended at Appomattox in April 1865. And with the waning of the war, Mormon statements about the conflict also lessened. The news of Lee's surrender was happily received in Utah. 
although celebrations were muted, as perhaps elsewhere throughout the land, by the reflection on the terrible destruction of the South, Sherman's march through Georgia, and the horror and devastation of the past few years. Furthermore, the attention of Latter-day Saint leadership now began to shift to protect that institu institution of plural marriage the nation had already vowed to exterminate. And that will be another war well worth watching. Thank you. The saints out here in the West? Yeah. Was, the, was there a, any concern at all? Well, a great deal of concern. Uh, you had both some from the North. Most Latter-day Saints were from the North. And I think it would be safe to say that their sympathies were for the North. They were very careful not to take much of an object uh, aside on this because we weren't sure who was going to win that war. And Utah's coming into the nation is going to depend a great deal on who's going to come into that war. It's also well known that we had a lot of Southerners here in, in Utah, and we had many of them brought their own slaves with them. And so it would be inaccurate to say that there was a total feeling one way or the other from either North or South. But I think you do see, Jim, a kind of a shift towards uh, sympathy towards Lincoln and a sympathy towards the North as the, as the war goes on. Uh, one of our colleagues has written Mary Jane Woodger on the changing attitudes towards the, uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamations and the whole passage that's going to be. But I think it's very clear that for the longest period of time, we're going to take a very careful stance on that war and what's going to happen. Um, we know neither north nor south, east or west. I think uh, officially it was going to be a neutral stance. Larry. I have a question that might be related. Uh, there's evidence that uh, Section 87 of the Geneva Treaty was not published intentionally. Uh, it wasn't published until 1861, and that was not even in the U.S. And that's a little bit of a curiosity. Um, it was clear also that the Latter-day Saints knew about Well, I, you're right. It wasn't published until 1851. Um, again, it goes back to this matter of which, you know, there's strong feelings between the North and the South, and we don't want to take necessarily a stance on this sort of thing too early, too avowedly. <coughs> but I think, too, that you can say that there were lots of, lots of prophecies clear back to Moroni, as you recall, on the night of September 21st and 22nd, where Moroni talks about these great judgments which are coming upon the lands, not just America. They were looking at it internationally as well as nationally, but clearly being very politically careful on some of these matters. We were growing very well in the South. We were growing very well in Texas and some of those places too. So we want to be very careful of which side we're going to take. Are you going to get out of here with only two questions? That's pretty darn good, right? <laughs> John. Do you think for all intents and purposes that, in fact, you know, the Utah has become Zion, so to speak? What's the question? Do you think that, in fact, Utah, Salt Lake City, has become Zion? That is to say that, uh, you know how the Lord talks about if men go to... Oh, you mean rather than Missouri? 
Correct. In some ways, yes, as the headquarters of the church. But I think Zion has a little bit of repenting to continue to do, right? Just like Missouri did. I think Zion's in the pew and heart, wherever it's going to be. Well, I hope I haven't made it too dark, folks. <laughs> hope there's not too much pain out there. <laughs>